Everybody thought he was just a lowly F-ranked adventurer, but he stumbled upon a damn golden servant card that summons a badass S-ranked goddess. And with her help, he's about to become the strongest of them all. Kai, this young dude, decides he's gonna be an adventurer, chasing that gold and glory. But damn luck ain't been on his side. He's been hustling his ass off every damn day for the past two years, but he's still stuck on the damn first floor of the dungeon. Just like any other day, Kai heads to the caves, moving slow as hell towards the slime on the ground. But instead of grabbing a sword or a knife like the regular folks, he whips out some insecticide and straight up sprays two bottles at that slime, watching it wither away and die. He is feeling pumped about how damn good he got at slaying the slimes. Ain't no surprise though, because this here is his 999th slime kill. Dude has been grinding in the dungeons like an NPC, squaring to hit that 1000 slimes mark. Kai keeps pushing deeper into that dungeon when all of a sudden, he spots a golden slime chilling on a pillar. He getting all hyped about his luck finding such a rare spawn for his 1000th kill. But damn this one ain't gonna be a piece of cake. As he tries to spray it with his bottle, that slime straight up jumps off the pillar like ain't no big deal. But Kai ain't letting that discourage him, so he grabs a new powerful spray gun filled with pesticide and blasts that slime taking it down for good. He's celebrating his damn 1000th kill, feeling like a champ. He can't wait to check his stats, thinking he's about to level up big time. But his level ain't changed even though he just wasted a golden slime. He decides to brush it off, hoping at least for some dope loot. But instead of a regular mana core, he finds this little golden card with a girl drawn on it. At first he all confused, but soon enough he figures it out. This here be a servant card, some super rare item. He checks out the stats and learns that this servant is a Valkyrie named Sylphie. And he even tries to search her on Instagram, but damn there ain't no info about her online. Kai decides to bounce out of that dungeon first before doing any more research. He starts heading back and as he passing by, he sees this crew of adventurers walking past him wearing some sick ass armor, which Kai can only look at with jealousy. He wonders whether he would ever be able to buy such a thing and heads over to the reception to get money in exchange for the slime cores. The receptionist Hitsugaya hooks my dude Kai up with 500 yen per slime core, so he ends up with a solid 1500 yen in total. It's a bit of a letdown, but Kai takes it and starts bouncing. But he suddenly stops and asks Hitsugaya if she knows the value of a rare servant card, especially if it's from the divine class. Hitsugaya takes a minute to think and straight up claims that a card like that would be hella collectible, worth over a billion yen without breaking a sweat. Kai's mind is blown, but he keeps his trap shut, heads back to his locker, tosses his stuff in there, changes into his regular clothes, and dips out of the place. Turns out that dungeon is part of some amusement park joint where folks can get memberships and go in to hunt for valuable shit. We then see little kids walking around in costumes, talking about how they're gonna be explorers when they grow up. But Kai was lost in his own thoughts, still tripping on that damn card. Then while he is waiting for the train, he bumps into his two homies Shinji and Hayato, and they all hop on that train together. Kai tells them he is still stuck at level 3, and asks why the hell they ain't exploring dungeons. Hayato comes back with a reply saying that two years ago, when they just started exploring the dungeons, they hit the second floor and ran into a goblin. They thought they could take that sucker down easy, but that goblin straight up whooped all their asses on his own. Ever since then, both Shinji and Hayato decided dungeons ain't their thing, and they happier checking out the other attractions with their passes. Later that night, Kai gets off the train and starts walking back home. He has dinner with his family, takes a bath, and crashes out. The next morning, he's still wondering if he should sell that card or not, as 1 billion yen can get him all the armor he wants, and he can buy as many video games as he wants. But then he gets interrupted by a voice, and it's his girl Katsu, asking where he was last night. My man decides to straight up lie and claims he was at a party with Shinji and Hayato. But shit, both of them spot Kai and roll it on him. Kai quickly pulls them aside and begs them not to spill the Katsu about him going dungeon crawling yesterday, and they agree to keep it on the down low. But when Katsu asks them what they did at the party, they end up saying different shit like playing arcade games, doing karaoke, and going bowling. Katsu ain't no fool though, he peeped the lies and asks if Kai hit the dungeons once again, but my dude manages to lie through his teeth and barely escapes the heat. Later that day in school, my dude Kai hits up his friends and asks what they would do with the servant card. No hesitation, they straight up say they'd sell that shit because it's worth a lot, and you can't summon a servant outside the dungeons anyways. Kai starts thinking about whether he should cash in on the item, but when he heads to the dungeons later, he decides to keep it for himself. Homeboy wants to become one of the topest adventurers the world has ever seen. He lays low making sure no cameras catch him and whips out the card. He calls out Sylphie the Valkyrie to be his servant, ready to follow his every command. All of a sudden, that card starts glowing and a bright-ass light shoots out of it. 
Next thing you know, it transforms into a massive woman with wings on her back and two melons up front. She's on some otherworldly shit as she grabs Kai and straight up disappears. Kai's dumbfounded trying to figure out what the hell just went down. Then he turns around and sees a little lowly in armor standing right next to him. He asks who she is and wonders if any kids got lost here, but this mini girl hits him back saying she's the Valkyrie Sylphie, his servant from now on. All of Kay's dreams of being a badass adventurer shatter in an instant. He drops to the floor, regretting the fact that he didn't sell that damn card. But he pulls himself together and gets back up. He tells Sylphie he got hunt some slimes. She immediately claims that she can sense one nearby, so Kai decides to test her intuition and tells her to lead him to the monster. Sylphie easily finds the slime, so Kai asks if she can kill it for him. She's down as hell and steps out into the open. Kai didn't expect much from this little girl, but damn Sylphie conjures this lightning attack so powerful that for a hot second, Kai thinks the whole damn cave's gonna collapse. Kai walks up to her asking if she's good, but she starts blushing and admits she's hungry as hell, needing some food. Kai looks at her and remembers that servants eat mana cores. So he feeds her the mana core from the slime and she gives him some thanks before saying there's more slimes nearby. He asks if she's got her strength back and she nods ready to roll out. But hold up, Kai stops her and asks if she can only detect slimes. Sylphie straight up claims she can sense all kinds of monsters, not just slimes. But after every battle, she gets hungry and needs to chow down on a mana core. Kai does the math and realizes this slime hunting gig ain't gonna cut it. He won't be raking in any cash like this. So he comes up with a plan and tells Sylphie to track down the slimes for him, and she's all down for it. Then he goes ham with his spray bottles, taking those slimes out one by one. It's the smartest move because finding those slimes is a pain in the ass. But this way, he can cut straight to the chase and blast them with his cheap insecticide sprays. After taking out a bunch of them, he levels up to level 4 and unlocks a new passive skill called Slime Slayer. That shit gives him a 50% boost in stats when he's fighting against slimes. He seems kinda let down by his new skill, but Sylphie boosts his morale, saying that getting a skill is an achievement in itself. He looks at her, smiles, and thanks her for the help. Then he says that he will be returning home now as it's getting late. Sylphie looks at him and asks if he'll summon her again soon, and he promises to summon her as soon as possible. So he recalls her back into the servant card and starts making his way back. He stops by the reception to sell the mana cores, and Hinsugaya is straight up shocked as she claims that he beat the daily slime extermination record by a large margin and asks how he did it. Kai plays it cool and lies, saying it was all luck. He snags his 15,000 yen reward and bounces home. Later that night, he's thinking about moving on to the second level of the dungeon. Goblins might be scary, but he's confident that with Sylphie by his side, they don't stand a chance. He has this dream about when he was a kid, watching TV with his girl Katsu. They were watching an interview about Katsu's dad, the most famous adventurer. That interview fills Kai with awe, and he decides right then and there to follow in his footsteps and become an adventurer himself. The next morning, he wakes up with a newfound determination and confidence. He gears up with Sylphie by his side and the sword and shield he bought with his hard-earned money. He's got his mind set on clearing every damn dungeon and becoming the most legendary adventurer in the whole damn world. They step into the cave and start walking when Sylphie peeps that something ain't right. She asks Kai if he good because dude looking pale is a ghost and shaking like crazy. Kai is straight up scared of this cave but lies to Sylphie, talking about how he is just hella excited. But the moment Sylphie mentions she can sense a goblin nearby, Kai flips the switch and starts hauling ass. Sylphie is confused as hell, asking what the hell he doing, but Kai lies straight to her face, saying he has some urgent business back home. Then it hits him, he remembers Katsu's pops doing an interview on TV. He realizes he can't just give up on his dreams like that, so he grabs his wooden sword and tells Sylphie to lead the way. They find the goblin snoozing behind a massive rock, but Kai is too scared to do shit. He asks Sylphie if she can handle killing it. She's down as hell and steps up to cast her spell. The goblin wakes up, ready to throw hands, but Kai jumps in between them with his sword in his hand and tells Sylphie he changed his mind, but he tells her to be ready to back him up. Kai charges at the goblin, swinging his sword, but he misses and the goblin backs off. This time, the goblin comes at him, trying to knock him to the ground, but Kai blocks the hit with his shield at the last second. They go back and forth, struggling it out, but Kai starts gaining ground. He shoves the goblin away and it falls to the ground. Kai sees his chance and goes in for the kill with his sword, but damn the goblin blocks the strike, grabs the sword, and disarms Kai. Then that goblin jumps at him, ready to end it all. Kai falls back without any defenses, but he remembers he got the sprays. He whips them out real quick and sprays that shit in the goblin's eyes. The goblin gets blinded by it, and that's when Kai takes the opportunity to land the final blow. He grabs his sword, 
Rushing at the goblin, Adami trips over a dan rock and falls to the floor, accidentally stabbing that goblin right in the chest, taking it out instantly. Sylphie is all happy congratulating Kai, but my dude is still scared as hell. He grabs the mana crystal, feeling thankful to be alive. Suddenly, a golden glow surrounds him, and he realizes he leveled up once again. He checks his stats, and got a new skill called the Goblin Slayer. He got mixed feelings about that shitty skill, but he decides his skill is his skill, and keeps it moving. They are going deeper into the damn cave when another goblin straight up attacks them. But Sylphie is holding it down with her defensive barrier, blocking all the attacks like a boss, while Kai is slicing that monster with perfect timing and taking it out. Kai then goes and kills his third goblin by blinding it with that spray bottle once again then finishing it off, while Sylphie is dragging his ass to face another goblin. Kai kills that goblin too with a head strike, and in the process he ranks up to level 6. They keep on walking and Kai asks Sylphie if she knows anything about these dungeons, but Sylphie replies that she has no idea, and all she knows is that her sole purpose is to help her master. They keep moving deeper, and they find the final goblin of the day. That sucker attacks Kai, but Sylphie unleashes her lightning magic and straight up destroys that beast. Kai feeds her the mana core and they bounce outside. Kai hands over the mana crystals to Hitsugaya. Once again, he lying his ass off, saying it was all just a fluke. Then he heads back home and Dan his body is so damn sore he can't even move from his bed. Next morning, he dragging his lazy ass to school with Katsu. Katsu peeping the situation, knowing Kai must have hit the dungeons, but Kai straight up denies it, claiming he was just doing some gym bodybuilding. Katsu let it slide and they keep on walking. They finally make it to their classroom and Kai starts spilling to Shinji and Hayago about his new adventures in the level 2 dungeons. He tells them how he straight up killed 4 goblins. They are damn surprised, having a hard time believing Kai ain't talking smack. But he promises them he ain't lying and says he's going even deeper today. After school, he heads back to the dungeons with Sylphie. They start exploring the distant parts of the cave, taking out goblins with some sick teamwork. Sylphie blocking the attacks while Kai lands the killing blow. And when Kai gets tired, Sylphie steps up and finishes off the monsters with her lightning magic. After that adventure, Kai sleeps like a log at night. The next day, he upgrades to a metal rod, dealing some serious damage to the goblins. But he is so damn exhausted that he ends up snoozing even in the classroom. But that ain't stopping him from his adventures. He's hitting the dungeon day after day, taking out goblins by any means necessary till he hits level 10, which is a major milestone for him. This time, he unlocks a special skill called Divine Love, boosting his stats with every level up. The power of that boost be depending on how much love and care the Divine Goddess is showing him. So he decides he gotta confess how stoked he is to be adventuring with someone as cool as Sylphie. But damn, this poor Loli doesn't even know what kind of psycho manipulator this guy is, so she just happily thanks him for being there and loves working with him. After that, the next monster they run into is a glowing skeleton, something they ain't faced before. Kai tells Sylphie to stay alert, and she throws up her magic barrier as the skeletons come rushing at them. The skeleton is slamming against that barrier, trying to break through. But before he can do that, Kai decides to attack. But damn, his attack is doing nothing because his weapons ain't strong enough for this rare spawn. So he asks Sylphie to handle it, and she starts chanting her spell and blasts that skeleton with a lightning bolt, killing it instantly. This time, the mana core that drops is bright red. Kai is wondering if it is rare, but he feeds it to Sylphie anyway, and she claims it is tastier than usual. Later that day, when he takes his loot to Hitsugaya, he asks about the mana core from that glowing skeleton. She tells him it is a pretty rare drop and could fetch around 2 million yen, so Kai is crushed. He could have been a millionaire, but Sylphie Dunn ate his money. Hitsugaya tells him not to worry though, because if he encountered it once, there's a good chance he'll come across it again. That night, he is thinking about the money he lost, but he decides it doesn't matter because he's still leveled up like crazy. He starts wondering if he can move on to the third floor now, but he knows on that floor, the enemies come in groups and can be way more dangerous. So he decides to keep that in mind and stay prepared. The next day, he tells Sylphie that he wants her to just watch for a while without doing anything else. She gets scared, thinking she did something wrong and apologizes. But Kai explains that he wants to go to the third floor, but he's scared he'll rely too much on her to save his ass. So he wants to get stronger first. Sylphie seems relieved and wishes him good luck. And then out of nowhere, a damn goblin pops up from behind a rock. Kai confidently tells Sylphie to watch from the back as he handles it. But the plan backfires big time, and he ends up getting messed up real bad. He gotta buy potions from Hitsugaya, and that blows away all his damn savings. That night, he thinks about how he needs a bunch of mana cores to feed Sylphie and get better gear. So he decides to start from scratch and heads back to the first floor to kill as many slimes as possible, gaining skills, levels, and mana cores. 
After hustling his ass off in the dungeons alone for several days, he finally collects enough mana cores to feel confident moving on to the third floor. But before they can leave the cave, Sophie says she can sense a different kind of slime. And damn, she is right because Kai spots a silver slime nearby. He jumps into action, rushing that slime with his spray gun. But that sucker is fast and dodges away. But luckily, Sylphie is right there ready to go. She unleashes her lightning magic and straight up kills that slime. And here's the crazy part, that slime drops another servant card, and that is some insane luck. Kai picks up the card and sees it's a demon rank card for a servant named Luceria. He looks at Sylphie, and she looking upset, which makes him realize that demons and goddesses don't mix well. But even with that, he decides to follow his own desires and without even talking to Sylphie about it, he summons that demon servant right then and there. A huge red flame surrounds them, and a massive demon lady emerges, flying straight through Kai in her ethereal form, just like what happened with Sylphie. He looks down and sees another lowly, but this time she got bat wings and horns on her head. And he realizes with a demon and a goddess on his side, his party gonna be unstoppable. He is straight up crushed when he peeped that shorty ain't looking anything like the fine girl on the card. Anyways, they do the intro thing and swap names, then Shorty thinks Kai ain't reliable or smart, and Sylphie is not happy to see her dissing their master like that. Luceria tells her not to worry about the foul mouth because all demons are talking like that, and Sylphie is cool with it, if that's the deal. Then Luceria asks Kai about Sylphie and notices she looks like a Valkyrie. Sylphie tells her she is Kai's servant just like her, and she is down to work together. Luceria feels the same and asks Kai for some mana core because she is hungry. But he shuts her down saying she ain't done shit yet. Then Selfie spots a slime nearby and Luceria steps in all smug to handle it. She busts out a crazy strong move called Hellfire of Destruction and wipes that slime out. And Kai feeds her the core after she demands it. But one ain't enough for her and she asks for more. Kai tells her he ain't got any, and she thinks he a cheap ass for it. Then he asks her to show off her other move called Corrosive Breath. Sure he ain't thrilled about working more because he ain't given her more magic cores, but he promises to hook her up later. After that, she uses corrosive breath to take out a goblin, and that shit practically melts the poor thing and Sylphie and Kai can't even watch because it's too nasty. Kai hands her the mana core and Luceria likes the taste of this one better, so she suggests they should explore the lower floors for more tasty cores from stronger monsters. But Kai stops her, saying there's more monsters on the third floor. Luceria doesn't see a problem with that, and Kai lets her know the guys secure new weapons and supplies before they head down. He asks if she knows this dungeon, and since she is not, she agrees to listen to him. He says, they'll hit up the third floor tomorrow because she might be tired today. She ain't feeling tired, but she agrees to listen to him after Sylphie tells her she should listen to her master. The next day, the three of them head down to the third floor, and we see that Kai has bought a crossbow as his new weapon. Sylphie thinks the weapon fits in real good, and Kai tells her that the crossbow was mad expensive, but Luceria says the price doesn't matter. Then they spot two hellhounds and Kai takes aim, but he misses the shot. The hellhounds try to attack him, but Sylphie puts up a barrier and saves his ass. Then Luceria wipes them out with Hellfire of Destruction and Kai feeds her a core, but she ain't satisfied and wants another one. But Kai shuts her down because he won't have any left if she keeps munching them all. She ain't too thrilled about that, but Kai says he'll give her an extra core if she takes down more monsters, and he promises her that. She warns him that she'll send him to hell if he breaks that promise, and that freaks him out a bit. Then they come across two wild boars. Luceria uses Hellfire of Destruction again, but only one of them gets roasted, and the other one still charges at them. She tries to hit it with another attack, but Kai stops her so he can shoot it, but one shot ain't enough to kill the beast, so that startles Kai and he falls. Sophie tries to help with her divine lightning, but before she can, he finishes off the monster with another shot. Sophie praises Kai for that, but Luceria thinks he acted like a wimp, Kai notices he leveled up to level 11, and Luceria asks him for more magic cores. Later, we see Kai leaving the place, thinking he ain't gonna make any profit if he keeps feeding all the cores to the servants. On his way out, he hears a group of adventurers talking, and he finds out that those three girls can make it to the sixth floor without any problems. The scene cuts to Kai daydreaming in class, thinking they can make it to the sixth floor too if they hustle. He's all happy thinking about exploring deeper into the dungeon when his classmates wake him up. They wonder how he can be so carefree because they ain't got enough points to get into their dream schools. They find out he chills because he still ain't decided which school he gonna choose. Katsu overhears them and asks Kai which school he gonna pick. But he ain't sure what to say so he asks her first. She says she going to Oka Academy and wonders if he gonna enroll there too. Since he ain't made a choice, he tells her he will. She's hyped that they gonna roll to school together again and she dips when one of her homies asks her to help with the handouts. Kai is wondering what she is so happy about, and his crew thinks he is too oblivious for his own good. Then it cuts to him back in the labyrinth, and his peeps are straight up slaying all the monsters one by one. 
Unlike Silphy, Luceria is asking Kai for more cores, and he ain't got no choice but to listen to her. Silphy ain't too thrilled about this, but Kai doesn't catch on to what she's feeling. He keeps hooking up Luceria with more cores, and when Silphy looks at him, he asks if something ain't right, but she doesn't speak up. He knows something is off with her, but he can't figure out what, then we see him back in his house. He notices his mom watching some drama on TV, and he sees a similar situation going down there like the one he's dealing with now. Watching the drama, he figures Silphy is probably anxious because of the new servant, and he's scared it's gonna lead to a face-off between his two servants, just like in a drama. He thinks that would be messed up, and he's wondering how he can fix this. The next morning, he runs into Katsu on his way to school, and she peeps that he's looking hella tired. After chatting with him, she finds out he didn't get no sleep last night. She asks if he got some trouble and offers to help if she can. He tries to spill the truth, but he decides not to. And he tells her that his two friends done made friends with two girls who got totally different personalities and the quiet one ain't feeling the one with the attitude. They all trying to figure out how to make them get along and that kept him thinking all night. Katsu asks if he talked to the quiet girl about it. And she suggests he should ask the person directly. Afterwards, we see Kai only summons Silphy in the dungeon this time. So she asks about Luceria. He tells her he wants the two of them to talk alone. This makes Silphy blush, but she ain't too thrilled about him want to talk about Luceria. He asks if she doesn't dick her, and Silphy tells him that ain't true. At first, she did think Luceria was kind of scary, but now she knows the demon didn't mean no harm. She's just a nice and kind girl, and she loves her. Kai straight up asks her if she got any damn problems at all, and she informs him that she doesn't, but he keeps pushing her to come clean. He tells her she's important to him, and that straight up flusters Silphy. So since he won't let it go, she finally spills and tells him there's one thing that's been on her mind. She explains that her master is way too nice to Luceria, and she wants him to treat her the same damn way. Kai looks all confused because he doesn't think he has been treating them differently, but Silphy lets him know Luceria has been getting more cores recently. She mentions she used to be able to talk to him more before Luceria showed up, and she wants him to talk to her like they used to. Kai finally catches on that she's straight up jealous, so he agrees to give her as many cores as Luceria, and talk to her more from now on, and Silphy is hella happy to hear that. Later on, we peep Kai already starting to feed both girls the same damn number of cores. He's also giving props to Silphy for her killer attack on the monster they just faced. Then Luceria wants him to praise her too, and he does it, and that makes her act all smug. The three of them then run into a wild boar, and Silphy just straight up takes it out, leveling up in the process. Kai peeped that all her stats had shot up by a lot, so she's all happy about it, and Luceria congrats her too. Then they come across three hellhounds, and Silphy wipes them all out with one Dan attack. Kai is straight up surprised that she can take out three of them at once now. Then they go up against another wild boar, and Silphy defends everyone with a barrier. Kai notices that her barriers are also more durable now, and Luceria tries to attack the boar, but Kai shuts her down and handles it on his own. He feeds Silphy some more cores, and Luceria ain't too happy she ain't get to do nothing. Sophie then asked him something in a soft voice, but he can't hear her. He asked her to speak up, and she embarrassingly asked him to give her some more cores. Later on, he realizes that leveling up also made her appetite bigger than before, then he trades his cores for cash. It's a guy peeping that he has been bringing fewer cores lately, and he ain't too thrilled about it. The next day, we peep him straight up slaying slimes on the first level of the dungeon. Turns out he done killed 25 of them already. Sophie giving him props for that, but Luceria ain't happy because she ain't getting to throw down. Kai tells her he can't be saving up the mana cores if she's fighting alongside him. She wonders why he summoned her if that's the case, but Silphy tells her she is just happy to be supporting her master like this. Kai appreciates their support, and that makes Luceria happy too. But she ain't being too honest with her feelings, so she quietly says she's gonna keep supporting him. After that, he sells the slime cores, and Hitsugaya asks him if something is wrong with him because he has been only bringing slime cores lately. Kai says he just felt like going back to the first floor for a bit. Hitsugaya can't wrap his head around that because he should be ready for the fourth floor by now. Then we see Kaido hitting up the internet looking for some sick gear. He might be physically ready for the fourth floor, but his equipment ain't up to the task. He's thinking about getting fresh armor and he found a dope suit made of carbon monotubes, but that shit hella expensive and out of his budget, so he realizes he gotta make some more cash. The scene switches back to him in the dungeon. He comes across a blue metallic slime and he thinks that this must be thanks to his god blessing skill. So he expects to get a certain card as a drop. Then Luceria and Silphy surround the slime, and the two of them straight up attack it together. That slime ain't standing a chance after that, but Kai notices it drop a magic orb instead of a servant card. He explains that using this orb, he can master a spell and become a wizard, so he smacks it on the ground to use it. That gives him a new skill called Waterball. 
and he's hella excited to try it out, and he spots a hellhound to test it on. He straight up tells Sylphie to throw up her barrier and defend all of them. Then he orders Luceria to take out the monster if he misses. Sylphie puts up the barrier and he hits the hellhound with the water ball, but that shit doesn't do any damage to the monster, so Luceria steps in and wipes it out before it can attack them. Kai feels all disappointed seeing how useless his magic is. Sylphie trying to lift his spirits, saying it's still damn amazing that he can even use magic. Luceria chimes in, saying at least he won't have to worry about drinking water anymore, but Kai thinks he should have just sold the magic orb instead. At night, we peep a downcast Kai chilling in the park and Katsu rolls up on him. She asks what he's doing there at this hour, and he almost spills about his new magic skill. But he switches it up and starts talking about some whack movie that just dropped and how it was a letdown when he and his homie went to peep it. They head home together and Kai finds out Katsu is coming from her cram school just now. He thanked her for the advice she gave him the other day because it helped him solve his problem. She wonders if the situation was about him instead of his friends, but he tells her it wasn't, and she bounces to her house. Kai starts thinking if she was pissed at him just now, and we see that Katsu has noticed that he's hiding something. Kai wonders if she is jealous like Sylphie, and even though he is right, he thinks this can't be possible. The next day, Kai heads back to the dungeon to work on his water ball spell. He starts off slow, shooting a water ball at the wall, but it ain't doing much except getting the wall wet. Kai is already tired as hell from just one spell, but he keeps training. On his second try, he blasts that water ball as fast as he can, and both he and Sylphie are stoked about it, but Luceria ain't impressed because after just two water balls, Kai is completely drained and collapses on the ground. He heads back home and knocks out as soon as he hits the bed. In his dreams, Kai remembers watching Katsu's dad on TV when he was a kid, and how that made him dream of being an adventurer like him. All motivated by that dream, he hits the dungeon the next day and starts hustling on his water ball strikes again. He's gotten hella faster today and shoots a bunch of water balls at the dungeon walls. But eventually, he runs out of mana. He takes a quick break to catch his breath. But as soon as he's feeling better, he jumps right back into training. This time, he starts playing around with the shape of the water ball and turns it into a cube. He's thrilled with the success and keeps experimenting, giving different shapes to the water ball. But then he gets worn out real quick and falls on his back. As he's mindlessly walking out of the dungeon, he trips and falls right into the arms of another adventurer. He quickly gets up and apologizes, but this mature hot adventurer asks if he's alright. Kai says that he is good and leaves, but this mommy's concerned because he ain't looking too well. Her crew though, they're impressed by his hustle and heads into the dungeon. Later, Kai is knocking out in class, and when the teacher wakes him up, he straight up shouts that he's gonna give it his all in training today. The whole class starts cracking up. During break, his friends come up to him and ask what he was talking about with the training stuff. Kai tells them he's practicing a crucial skill for his dungeon success. But just then, Katsu shows up. She asks if he's training for the dungeon, but Kai switches it up and says he's talking about dance practice. Katsu's relieved and tells him not to overdo it. Then she says she wants to see his dance performance someday and leave, leaving Kai and the boys alone. The next day, Kai heads back to the dungeon for some real combat action with his water ball. He shoots a goblin with it, but instead of popping like usual, the water ball stays solid and clogs up all the goblin's airways, suffocating the poor sucker to death. Sylphie and Luceria give him props for it, but then Kai realizes that he ain't getting any more experience points from the monsters on the third floor. That means it's time for them to level up and head down to the fourth floor. Kai figures he needs some dope gear if he's gonna tackle the fourth floor, so he decides to finally cop something that's been on his wish list for a while. The next day, he rolls up wearing a tight-ass bodysuit. Sophie thinks he's rocking it, but Luceria straight-up shatters his ego by calling him lame. Kai tells her the suit is high-end and pricey because it's made of carbon nanotubes that protect him from mad damage while still being thin and light. He explains how the suit's got top-notch defense against arrows and other piercing attacks, and he's got a magic amplifying bracelet that'll make even his weak spells hit a bit harder. But he hasn't tested it out yet because there ain't no option for that. Kai starts showing off other stuff he bought like a potion, but Luceria drags Sylphie away because she's bored with Kay's display. They eventually make their way to the fourth floor, where Sylphie senses a big-ass creepy monster coming their way. Before Kai can check the monster encyclopedia to see what they're up against, a freaking giant cockroach shows up, and both girls freak out and cling to each other. They start blasting magic spells like crazy at the roach monster while hauling ass through the dungeon, and Kay is just trying to keep up because he doesn't want to be left alone. After they exhaust themselves, Sylphie and Luceria take a breather and almost attack Kai when he comes running up to them. Sylphie runs over and hugs him, saying she was scared shitless, but Luceria is still playing her Sundare act and claiming she ain't scared of no measly bugs. Sylphie then apologizes to Kai for leaving him behind and begs him to scold her. He tells her he ain't mad because they cleared the fourth floor in record time with their wild rampage, and he's collected a lot of mana cores from all the defeated monsters. Luceria refuses to eat the nasty bug crystals, but she's too hungry to turn them down. 
Turns out, the crystals taste just as awful as the girls expected. Kai says that since they got some crystals, they should scout on the fifth floor for some time. Sophie's got that sixth sense and senses the sand monster and wood monster nearby. Kai takes aim with his crossbow, but his first arrow misses and the second one goes right through the sand monster who immediately retaliates and attacks him. Kai shouts out Sophie's name as she's quick on her feet, throwing up a barrier to protect him. Kai figures these two monsters are immune to physical attacks, so he turns to Luceria for backup, and she straight up obliterates them with her fiery attack. Kai asks if she needs to recharge her mana with the nasty crystals, but neither Luceria nor Sylphie want to touch that disgusting stuff. They keep exploring the fifth floor, but it seems like there ain't no more monsters nearby. Just then, Sylphie spots something weird on a wall, but Kai isn't seeing anything special about it. Sylphie decides to go all out and blast a hole in the wall with her lightning attack, and damn, it opens up a secret passageway. They start heading in, and Kai warns the girls to watch out for any traps. But just as he was saying this, Lucyria tells him that it's too late for the warning. She steps right on a trap trigger, and an arrow gets shot out. But instead of hitting Lucyria, it nails Kai, and he's on the ground writhing in pain. His crew's all worried, but thankfully, his bodysuit protects him from any serious damage, so he bounces back in a few minutes. They keep moving forward, but then Luceria steps right on another trap tile. This time, Kai steps back to avoid the arrow, but he gets zapped by lightning instead. Surprisingly though, he's totally fine and feels a bit energized. Luceria tells him to stop making her worry, but when he asks if she was actually worried about him, she's all sundier and defaults to her usual mode. Eventually, they come across a massive gate with a badass painting on it, and Sylphie senses a crazy strong presence on the other side. Kai's ready to call it a day and head home, but the two girls ain't letting him off the hook that easily. He tries opening the gate, but that thing ain't budging. So Sylphie just unleashes her lightning attack on it, and Kai is sincerely hoping he won't get charged with destruction of dungeon property. They step inside and come face to face with two badass monsters. One's a red ogre, and the other's a massive slime. Kai ain't backing down now that they've come this far, so he tells his girls to focus on taking down the red ogre first. They unleash their lightning and fire attacks, but that ogre barely even flinches because it's immune to skill damage. But then the ogre charges at them, but Sylphie's barrier skill blocks its attack. Kai tells Luceria to handle the slime while he takes shots at the red ogre with his crossbow. Each arrow he fires chips away at the ogre's health, but then he runs out of arrows. The pissed off ogre starts pounding the barrier and meanwhile, Luceria is struggling to deal with the giant slime on her own. As a last resort, Kai decides to rely on his water ball. He conjures up a water ball, but it freezes because of the bracelet's effect. He shoots the ice ball at the red ogre, slowly wearing down its health. But then he realizes his mana's running low. So Kai gets crafty and shapes his ice balls into sharp icicles that pack a bigger punch against the red ogre. With the final three shots in his arsenal, Kai brings down the red ogre, and now it's just the slime left. The slime's about to smack Luceria, but Kai jumps in and defends her with his shield. He holds the slime back and tells Sylphie to get ready for her divine spear attack. But damn, his shield and gear start melting. But Sylphie charges at the slime with her divine spear and pierces right through it. But even then though, it doesn't do much damage to the monster. Kai's ready to throw in the towel, but then he remembers his hero and charges forward, dodging the slime's attacks. And then he pulls out his trusty bug spray because, giant or not, that monster's still a slime. The slime's health keeps dropping and Sylphie protects Kai with her magic barrier. Kai runs out to the first two bottles, so he digs into his bag and whips out two extra strong bug sprays. He unleashes them all on the slime and finally the slime's health hits zero and it bites the dust. The girls all excitedly hug Kai, but they end up hurting his injured shoulder. No worries though, because he fixes it up by shoving a health potion. Right after that, Luceria levels up, and then Kai checks out his stats to find that he's also leveled up a whole lot too. He wastes no time and starts gathering mana cores. He stumbles upon the red core of the ogre, which he knows will fetch a pretty penny. When he goes looking for the slime's core, instead he comes across a rare grade magic sword. Thing looks more like a steak knife than a magic sword. Later on, Kai takes the red ogre's mana core to Hitsugaya, who's all curious about where he found it. He tells her about the hidden dungeon on the fifth floor and how he kicked the boss's ass. Hitsugaya says they gotta check that dungeon out fast and lets Kai in on the fact that the red mana core is worth a whole lot of cash. Kai is stoked to hear that news and with another good news, Hitsugaya invites him to join an event next week where they'll be taking on the seventh floor as a group. The following week, Kai heads to the event and bumps into the three girls from the other day. Their leader, Eri, introduces herself and the pink cat girl goes by Miko, while the last one is Hikari. Kai introduces himself and knows that they will all be on the same team. Meanwhile, Katsu has this dream about the past, where she sees her dad heading off to the dungeon. She asks him to come back as soon as he can, and he promises her that he will come home early so they can have dinner together. He then heads out, and that's when Katsu wakes up. 
She decides to go to her friend's place to study. As she steps out of the house, she starts wondering if Kai is busy with dance practice or muscle training today. We then cut to the scene where all the event participants are lining up to get teleported. Kai's crew is holding hands, standing in the teleport circle, and then boom, they are on the sixth floor. Kai is super relieved they arrived safely. He tells the others that it's only his second time using the gate, so he was pretty nervous. He explains the first time he used it was when he traveled from the sixth floor to the ground yesterday. He finds out that it's the same for them, and they are nervous as well. They soon come across a staff member who guides them to the stairs leading to the seventh floor. The staff member informs them that today's event is scheduled to last for three hours. As they near the stairs, they notice a convenience store. Ari asks Kai if he wants to buy anything, so Kai thinks it's super convenient to have a store in the dungeon and decides to grab some refills for his pesticide spray. His teammates notice he's carrying a lot of luggage. But Kai thinks it's strange that they're traveling so light, and they explain it's because they have magic bags. Kai is shocked because magic bags cost as much as a mansion. They tell them their parents bought the bags for them, and Kai realizes that they all come from wealthy families. Ari then asks Kai if he's got the proper equipment with him. Embarrassed, he admits that he started with small things and is slowly working his way up, buying everything with the money he made from selling magic cores. Michael points out that he's only wearing a tight suit, and Hikari scolds her, saying it's not nice to be so blunt. They all then gear up and head to the seventh floor. As they explore the floor, they talk and Kai finds out that mostly golem-type monsters appear on this level. Hearing this, he realizes that his teammates must have done some recon on this floor, so they explain that scouting the area is essential for winning any game. Kai agrees but also knows that this is much more serious than just a game. Suddenly, they notice some shadows approaching them and quickly put up their guard. However, they soon realize that it's only the staff members who are cleaning the dungeon. The staff members tell them to do their best in the event and then move on. Kai tells everyone that he is at level 16 and wonders what levels they are at. Eri responds, I'm at level 18 and Hikari and Miko both say they are at level 15. Miko also mentions that Hikari has an MP of 75, which surprises Kai since he only has half of that, so he thinks she's amazing. They then come across a stone golem. Eri orders Hikari to get ready to use her magic and tells Miko to protect Hikari while she fights the golem. Kai asks what he should do and Eri tells him to watch her back. Eri attacks the golem and manages to defeat it all on her own and Kai finds this impressive. They then encounter a bronze golem, so Hikari uses a spell called Earth Wave to trap it in a swamp and Miko summons her servant, Snatch, who dodges the golem's attacks and lands a wind spell on it. Hikari then uses a fireball spell on the monster and Eri finishes it off with her spear. Kai is amazed by their teamwork. Then he notices a monster behind Miko and Hikari, so they turn around to see an iron golem. Kai attacks it with his crossbow, but has no effect. Eri stops the monster from attacking Miko and Hikari, but the golem's skin is too tough for her attack to deal any real damage. Hikari uses her fireball on the monster and Miko attacks it with Snatch, but neither of their attacks have any effect and the monster injures Snatch. Seeing this, Kai thinks he needs to summon either Sylphie or Luceria, but he drops the plate knife from his bag and remembers reading about this magic sword online. He learned that it can deal whatever damage the user imagines, so Kai decides he needs to imagine himself defeating the monster. He tells Hikari to use Earth Wave to trap the monster. She does, and the monster is stuck. He then asks Eri to distract the monster, and she launches a barrage of attacks. Kai then attacks the monster from behind with a magic sword, imagining it blowing up and the monster actually explodes. And the others notice that Kai has the magic sword Balzard with him. Later, they are sitting in a cafe discussing their dungeon exploration. They talk about Kai's sword, and Kai explains that he got it as a drop item the other day and is glad it worked since it was his first time using it. Kai asks Miko how Snatch is doing and is relieved to hear that he's alright. Kai mentions that it was his first time seeing a carbuncle, and that he's never even seen one in a video before. Miko explains that servants can't be captured on camera, and Eri asks Kai if he has ever seen any of them on video. Kai realizes he hasn't, which explains why the guild officials never asked him about Sylphie and Luceria. He wonders if they are the only ones who know about Snatch. Miko clarifies that she picked Snatch up from an auction and registered him with the guild, so everyone knows about him. Miko suggests they should all put matching keychains on their magic pouches to commemorate participating in the event, and everyone agrees. Afterward, Eri asks Kai to join their party as a permanent member, explaining that there are transfer gates on every five floors, and their current goal is to reach the transfer gate on the 11th floor. Kai likes the idea but insists that he's just an ordinary explorer and not as special as they are. They reassure him, saying they feel safer with him around. They ask if he has anyone else in mind for a party, reminding Kai of Sylphie and Luceria. Kai worries that if they find out he is bringing two little girls into the dungeon, he might get reported. He asks for some time to consider it. Miko wonders if he dislikes their party, 
but he assures her he needs to consult someone first and will give them an answer later. They understand, and Eri asks him to contact her once he's decided. He agrees, and the scene shifts to him returning to the dungeon. Inside, he summons his servants, who are upset that he didn't summon them earlier. Kai explains he's considering forming a party with others, but his servants are unhappy and can't believe it's the first thing he mentions after seeing them. He tells them he didn't abandon them, explaining he had business to handle and couldn't summon them in the morning. He tries to discuss the party again, but they insist that the three of them are fine as they are. Kai persists, but Silphy firmly tells him to end the conversation here. Luceria gets all mad at him for always calling her by her full name, and Kay's got no idea what else to call her. She points out he calls Silphy by her nickname, Sile, so he realizes that this time Luceria is the one who's jealous. He suggests a few nicknames for her, but she likes Luce. She mentions that Kai will have to call her this from now on, and he agrees. The two of them then go ahead to explore the dungeon, and Kai states that they still haven't cleared up the party thing, but they ignore him. The next day while going to school, Katsu asks Kai if he practiced dancing over the weekend or if he did muscle training, and Kai states that he's doing both. She's glad to hear this and asks him if he'd like to go out shopping with her next Saturday, and he shyly agrees. Katsu then notices one of her friends ahead and walks the rest of the way with her. Kai also encounters his friends on the way, and they have heard about the shopping trip, so they wonder if they're going on a date. Kai doesn't think that Katsu would be interested in going on a date with him, and his friends are disappointed at seeing how clueless he is. They then ask him about the event and wonder if he partnered with an old dude, but he informs them that he joined a party of three girls, one two years older than him, another the same age as him, and the last one a year younger. Hearing this, his friends wonder if the dungeon is a more fun place than they expected, and they think about heading back in there as well. The scene then cuts to Saturday and Kai picks up Katsu from her home, and they head to the subway station. There, he notices a broadcast of the dungeon TV show. Watching it, we find that magic cores are valuable resources and can be traded for money. They still haven't figured out how to use them, but they are filled with an unknown energy that can be useful in the future. Seeing this, Katsu thinks that Kai is really interested in dungeons and she tells him to forget about it for today and focus on their shopping trip, and he agrees. While walking around the town, Katsu wonders when was the last time the two of them went out like this. Kai then thinks back to when they were little and remembers her dad taking them to all sorts of places. Katsu recalls their camping trips and movie nights and suggests they should catch a movie next time, to which Kai agrees. They then hit the stores for some clothes shopping. Katsu tries on a few outfits and Kai compliments every one of them. Finally, she asks which one he likes best and he picks the one she's wearing. Afterward, they head to the park, where Katsu spots some boats and suggests they go for a ride. As they paddle around, Katsu notices some beautiful fish in the water, but Kai thinks she's even more beautiful. He sees couples in the other boats and thinks they must look like a couple too, but then quickly dismisses the thought, reminding himself they're just hanging out. Katsu notices that Kai looks a bit more built than usual and figures his muscle training is paying off. Kai agrees and she says they should have more outings like this. The scene then cuts to them sipping juice, both enjoying their flavors. Katsu asks if Kai wants to try her flavor and Kai agrees, offering her a sip from his glass. After tasting her flavor, he thinks it's pretty good. Katsu hesitates for a moment, thinking of it as an indirect kiss, but then goes for it, and likes it too. They head to the subway station and spot an advertisement about the dungeon. Katsu then sees a dad holding his daughter and tells Kai she wants to visit another place. She leads him to the dungeon theme park, and he wonders if she wants to go inside since the parade and fireworks are about to start. But she just asks if the dungeon building is inside the park, explaining that's where her dad is. We learned she had been dreaming about the last time she saw her dad, who promised to have dinner with her but never came home, and she questions why he even goes into the dungeon. Then she tells Kai that she had a great time today, and suggests that they head home now. Kai knows she's worried about her dad, but he is determined to prove that he can be a hero just like her dad. The next time Kai rolls into the dungeon, he starts mixing up his different abilities. He coats his magic sword Balzard with water ball, and even though Luceria is skeptical, it turns out to be a win, and by using it, Kai takes down the stone golem in one hit. He's pumped and Silphy claps for him, telling Luceria their master is getting stronger real quick. Luceria fires back, saying it's gotta be because of a woman, which throws Kai off. He asks why she thinks that, and she says it's just her gut feeling. Seeing him all nervous and guilty, Silphy asks if the reason he wanted to join a party the other day was also because of a woman. Kai doesn't know what to say at first, but ends up confessing that a party of three girls invited him. Silphy feels a bit insecure hearing this, but Luceria thinks he doesn't want to waste any more mana cores on them. She's about to go off on him for treating them like that, but when Kai promises to keep feeding them mana cores, Luceria forgives him easily. Kai says he's not joining the party, but Silphy suddenly tells him to go for it. She says if her master decides to join another party, she wants to support him and Luceria agrees as long as she gets her mana cores. 
Sophie then asks Kai to at least explain why he wants to party with someone else. He replies that he wants to grow stronger by fighting alongside other humans. Otherwise, he'll never catch up to Sylphie and Luceria. The girls are cool with his reasons and Kai promises he'll only party with Ares' team on weekends, so they can still hang out on other days. At night, Kai realizes getting permission from an angel and a devil was easier than calling a girl. He's staring at the phone, too embarrassed to call Ari and tell her he agreed to join the team, but suddenly Katsu calls him. He picks up, panicking, and Katsu says she just wants to chat for no particular reason. Kai's happy to help, but first asks if she knows any ways to reduce nervousness. She asks why, and Kai uses his friends as the excuse, saying they want to call a girl, but are too nervous about it. Katsu starts sharing the story about she was too nervous to play piano on stage. Her old man literally pasted his smile on her face, and that did wonders for her nerves. Kai says he'll give it a shot, and then Katsu wishes him goodnight and hangs up. Kai's left wondering what she wanted to talk about in the first place but doesn't think much of it, and he calls Eri, who's practicing hard at her family's dojo. She's been waiting for his call and hits him up about joining their crew. Kai agrees but he can only swing by on weekends, and Eri says that's perfect, since they only hit the dungeon on weekends. Next Saturday, Kai links up with the crew and dives back into the dungeon on the seventh floor. Then a gang of stone golems rolls up looking for a rumble, so Kai steps up, telling Hikari and Miko to back him up. Hikari drops some ground magic to pin down a couple of golems, while Miko brings out her sidekick Snatch to keep the third one busy. Kai seizes the moment, powers up his magic sword with water ball, morphing it into an ice sword, and drops a golem with one swing. Another golem tries to attack, but Kai dodges and takes it out in one hit too. Meanwhile, Miko's servant slices up a golem with wind blades, and Eri takes down another. The girls are curious about when Kai learned magic and why his water ball looks like a sword. He says he only knows one water spell and has been experimenting. Eri says his ice blade and command skills were impressive, and she can't believe it's his first time fighting in a group. So to dodge more questions, Kai compliments Eri's weapon skills, and she says she's been practicing since she was a kid. Suddenly, Kai's stomach roars, and he asks for a lunch break. To his surprise, they whip out a whole kitchen from their magic bags and cook up a frying fish and grilling steaks in the damn dungeon. When Kai gets home that night, he thinks Eri and her friends have generational wealth he can only dream of. But more importantly, Eri has plans to explore the 8th floor the next day. The 8th floor has aquatic monsters and water-based terrain, so Kai buys a high-end life jacket because he doesn't know how to swim. Soon they arrive at the 8th floor and Snatch detects a monster lurking in a pool of water. A salamander emerges from the pool and spits acid at Kai, instantly melting his expensive life jacket. He freaks out and demands the monster to refund him for the life jacket, but it spits more acid at him, and he can only dodge it. Just then, Meko takes it down with the crossbow Kai lent her since he wasn't going to use it anymore. He asks if she has practiced before, and she replies that she just held a crossbow for the first time in her life, but managed to get a headshot on her first try. Soon after that, they encounter more water-themed monsters and spend most of the time running away. Then, a squid monster flings Kai into a pond and he flails around because he can't swim. Eri tells him to stop being a wimp because the water is not deep at all. While he deals with his embarrassment, Hikari has already roasted the squid. Next, they face some flying tuna monsters that leap out of the water to attack them. Kai attacks them with his mana gun while the girls use their weapons to thin out the fish monsters. Kai soon runs out of ammo and notices how effortlessly Eri is slashing down monsters with her long-handled blade. So he shapes his ice sword into a similar weapon and begins taking down the fish monsters, but each slash consumes a decent chunk of his mana. The girls also notice him cutting down the monsters with ease, but just as Kai finishes, he runs out of mana completely and collapses. When he wakes up, he finds himself in Eri's lap and gets up quickly, apologizing for the trouble and assuring her that he is fine. To his surprise, his MP is full, and Eri reveals that she gave him a mana potion while he was unconscious. Kai says that it must have been expensive, but she tells him not to worry because they are party members. Eri then brings up his fighting style and he replies that he based it on her style. Before they can discuss it further, Snatch warns everyone about a very powerful monster. Everyone is on guard, and then a huge dinosaur monster emerges from the water. Kai panics, saying that dinosaurs are high-level monsters found only on deeper floors. Kai and the girls try to run away, but the dino follows them. Due to its immense weight, the floor crumbles, blocking their exit. Realizing they got no way out, Kai tells everyone they got a fight to survive. He tells Miko and Ikari to hit the dino from a distance, and asks Eri to attack while he distracts it. Hikari's earth magic and Snatch's wind blades ain't doing shit, and even though Kai stabs it with his ice blade, it barely scratches the damn thing. The dino gets pissed and goes after Kai, making him run. And this gives Eri the perfect chance to strike. So she jumps on the dino's head and stabs it with her spear, but ain't enough. Then the monster throws her off, and as Kai checks on Eri, she mutters about becoming a hero, but passes out reaching for her weapon. 
Kai thinks about calling Sylphie and Luceria, but decides that it wouldn't be the best idea to reveal them to others. Then he sees the monster going for Hikari and Miko, and realizes he can't hesitate. He pulls out the servant cards and summons his girls. Then a wild storm of divine and demonic energy whips up before Sylphie and Luceria appear, leaving everyone in awe. Even Eri opens her eyes just in time to see Sylphie and Luceria show up. Kai apologizes for calling them on short notice, and asks them to take down the dino. They use their lightning and fire attacks and bring down the dino in seconds. Once the fight is done, Sylphie runs to Kai asking if he's hurt. He says he's fine, and then Luceria steps up, teasing that Kai was after women in the end. But suddenly Miko jumps on Sylphie, amazed by how she has never seen anyone as cute as her before. She asks if Sylphie is a real angel, while Hikari thanks Luceria for saving them and fawns over the cute demon Loli. Luceria tries to stay cold but can't resist Hikari's emotional pleading look to hug her, so Luceria lets her get close. Even Eri is charmed by their cuteness, but she holds back herself and asks Kai if these girls are his servants, and he confirms that they are. Later they get out to the dungeon and Hikari's parents come to pick her and Miko up. Once they're alone, Kai remembers Eri trying to get back in the fight even after getting knocked out, saying she wants to be a hero. He asks if they can talk about it, and finds out her dad inspired her to be a hero who takes on big challenges and saves everyone. So Kai thinks he and Eri are the same. After that, she invites him to an open campus event at her university the next weekend. Kai talks about it to his friends because Eri goes to a prestigious school. They tell them to invite Katsu instead of them since she's interested in that university too, and they can call it their second date. Kai panics hearing that, but Katsu hears her name and brings her friend along, asking if they were talking about her behind her back. Kai tries to deny it, but his friends push him ahead. He uses the nervousness removal technique before telling Katsu about the open campus event. Turns out Katsu was already planning to go and wanted Kai to be with her from the start. The next weekend, she wears the dress Kai picked for her on the previous date to the open campus event. When Kai sees Katsu, he can't help but think she looks cute. They then head off to Oka Academy, and the next thing you know, they're on the train. Kai is sitting a little too far from Katsu, but quickly moves closer when she tells him to. She then thanks him for inviting her to the open campus, but Kai, Trying to play it cool says it's no big deal since he was planning to go anyway. Katsu mentions that she enjoys it more with the two of them together, and Kai can't help but agree. For a moment, it feels like a date, but he quickly reels it in and reminds himself that they're just checking out the academy. Katsu buzzing with excitement, talks about how eager she is to see Oka Academy. It turns out Shinji and Hayato are also on the train, equally excited. Kai a bit surprised, asks why they're tagging along since their plans involve different schools. They casually explain that they just wanted to experience an open campus themselves, reassuring him they have no intention of playing third wheel between the two of them, but Kai brushes off their remarks, focusing on Katsu instead. As they continue the ride, Kai spots a poster about the dungeon on the train, and Katsu then notices his interest and asks if he's bummed about missing out on the dungeon. With a smooth move, he tells her that going to the open campus with her is way better than any dungeon. So Katsu smiles and suggests they forget about the dungeon for today, and soon after, they arrive at Uka Academy. The Grand Campus immediately impresses them and one glance is enough to tell this is where the elite gather. Katsu suggests heading to the reception, and on the way they pass by some beautiful cherry blossom trees. Katsu imagines the two of them walking together under these cherry blossoms next spring and Kai can't help but picture the same. Lost in his daydreams, Kai starts to drift off but Katsu quickly snaps him back to reality. Realizing he's getting ahead of himself, Kai resolves to focus on studying hard and passing the exams to make his dream come true. He reminds himself that even if they both get into the academy, they'd just be classmates, and with that, he pushes his fantasies aside. After arriving at the reception, Kai spots Eri, who seems eager to get to know him better. She casually wonders if he's brought his friends along, but before Kai can even finish introducing them, his friends, suddenly energized by the sight of a beautiful girl, jump in to introduce themselves with an air of dignity they rarely show. Eri then asks if the girl with him is his girlfriend, but Kai quickly clarifies that Katsu is just his childhood friend and neighbor. Eri tells them to explore the campus on their own for a bit and mentions that she'll give them a proper tour once she's free from her duties. As they leave, Eri feels oddly relieved that Katsu isn't Kei's girlfriend, though she's not quite sure why. As they wander through the academy building, Katsu, ever curious, asks Kai how he and Eri met. Kai explains that they cross paths in the dungeon and the temperature seems to drop as Katsu shoots him a cold look. The atmosphere gets even frostier when Kai, without thinking, mentions that it was Eri who tipped him off about the open campus. Katsu trying to keep her cool spins the situation positively, saying that they should be grateful to Eri for giving them the opportunity to come here together. She reminds Kai of his promise not to talk about the dungeon today, and though her tone is calm, the underlying anger is hard to miss. Sensing the tension, Kai's friends quickly pull him aside away from Katsu, 
They ask if Ari is the person he mentioned when he talked about forming a party. And when he confirms it, they can't help but feel a pang of envy, regretting that they gave up on being explorers. Putting their jealousy aside, they advise Kai to watch what he says around Katsu, considering how concerned she is about his dungeon escapades. Kai nods in agreement, and the group continues their tour. They make their way to the auditorium, and they are immediately struck by how much bigger it is compared to their schools. Katsu points out the electric blackboard and mentions that students here even use tablets for their classes. Impressed, they also notice the sheer number of clubs available at the academy. Kai spots an AED nearby, and being the dungeon geek he is, starts to compare it to what they have in the dungeons, but his friends quickly shut him down. After checking out a few more spots, they head to the garden. The peaceful atmosphere wins them over, and Kai's friends start to think that this academy is pretty amazing. It's too bad their grades aren't good enough to get in. But Kai the optimist says he'll just have to study harder if he wants to make it here. His friends, though, are more concerned about how he'll afford the tuition. Kai starts to mention earning money through dungeon exploring but catches himself since Katsu is there, and instead says he'll get a part-time job. The four of them take a moment to relax and Katsu casually mentions how nice it would be to take breaks like this together between classes. Kai agrees, letting his mind drift into a daydream about it. Until Miko and Hikari show up, snapping him out of it. They tell them that Eri mentioned he was here, and once again, his friends ever the charmers, switch to dignified mode upon seeing the girls. Miko and Ikari spotting Katsu assume she's Kai's girlfriend, but he quickly clears that up just like he did with Eri. Kai remembers that Miko is still a second year and Hikari a first year, making him wonder why they're even touring a college already. Hikari says she wanted to check it out while she could, as it's a good opportunity, though Kai doesn't quite get what she's implying. Katsu then asks how they know Kai, and before he can even think of a response, the girls bluntly reveal that they're in a dungeon party with him. Katsu's mood instantly chills, but thankfully, Eri arrives just in time to break the tension. She suggests they all head to the cafeteria for something to eat, and everyone eagerly agrees. The scene shifts to them in the cafeteria, and everyone is blown away by the incredible menu. Eri points out that since it's a school cafeteria, the food is surprisingly affordable. They're amazed and dive into their meals, loving every bite. It's revealed that this is the first time the rich girls have ever eaten in a cafeteria, and are actually enjoying the experience. Then, when Katsu goes to get a refill, Kai offers to do it for her. But she suggests they grab enough for everyone, so the two of them head off together. Meanwhile, Hayato asks the girls if they ever encountered an instructor named Onigawara during their explorer training. They recall meeting him, and they all agree that they hated him because he was so strict. The boys nod in agreement, and Hayato starts to mimic Onigawara's behavior, which gets a laugh out of Hikari, who thinks he nails the impression. Feeling smug after the compliment, Hayato continues the imitation, but the girls quickly lose interest. Sensing the change in mood, Eri switches the topic, saying it reminds her of their explorer training, particularly when Onigawara scolded her during AED training. Mika wonders if Shinji and Hayato are also explorers, and they admit they are though, but only technically, since they completed the training but didn't pursue it further. Hayato mentions that the lectures were so long that Shinji kept dozing off, but Shinji is quick to point out that Hayato wasn't much better. Hayato goes on to explain that's why they didn't know dungeon items are only effective within a 3 km radius of the dungeon. He recounts how he once tried to use potions after getting hurt in a race, only to end up wasting all of them. Eri explains that's the reason a theme park was set up within that 3 km radius, and she mentions that all manufacturing and research of items and potions happen within that area. She adds that there are tons of rules and it's hard to keep track of them all, with the boys nodding in agreement. Shinji and Hayato chime in, saying at least the amusement park is fun, and Eri agrees, adding that the dungeon staff does an amazing job managing the park. She even reveals she wrote a report on it once. The boys start chatting about how awesome dungeons are, and Katsu overhears since she's standing right behind them. She and Kai then hand out drinks to everyone, and she can't help but wonder why people are so obsessed with exploring dungeons. Afterward, they continue their tour and check out the swimming pool. Kai mentions that the pool is heated, so you can swim even in the winter. The sight of the pool reminds him of the time Katsu saved him from drowning when they were kids. Mika overhears this and realizes that Kai still can't swim, and Hikari feels a weird twinge in her chest seeing him so close to Katsu. Mika is clueless about what's going on and asks Hikari about it, and Hikari admits it's a strange, unfamiliar feeling. They move on to the soccer field, and Hikari stumbles on the stairs, but Kai is right there to catch her, leaving her blushing in his arms. She thanks him, and Eri throws in a compliment about Kai's quick reflexes. Miko, not wanting things to get too awkward, reminds Kai to put Hikari down, which he does eventually. Just then, a soccer player accidentally kicks a ball toward Miko's face, 
but Kai channeling his inner Sigma male, steps in and saves her. Both Miko and Ikari are left swooning, their hearts skipping a beat. Yuke's friends can't help but think he's pretty cool, and Eri suggests they head to the dojo next. At the dojo, Eri has a moment of self-reflection, wondering why she invited them there when it was a part of the plan. But it's clear she just wants to impress Kai. So she shows off her skills with a spear, and after she finishes, everyone applauds, showering her with compliments. Eri, however, only cares about what Kai thinks, and it dawns on her why she wanted to show off in the first place. As the day wraps up, Kai and his friends get ready to leave the academy. Eri and the other girls exchange contact info with Katsu, offering help if she has any questions about the academy. Shinji and Hayato, not wanting to miss out, ask if they can get the girls' contact info too. They agree and the boys are over the moon. Kai and his friends thank Eri for the tour and they head out, leaving with a lot more than just memories of the campus. On the train ride back home, Kai is feeling pretty good about their visit to the academy, but his friends? They're way more focused on the girls they met. Hayato then asks Shinji which girl caught his eye, but they can't seem to pick just one. They start joking about how they should dive back into exploring dungeons. Who knows, maybe they'll find more girls like that. Kai quickly reminds them they're not supposed to be talking about this stuff, especially Lakatsu right there. She gives them a smile, but anyone paying attention can tell it's got a bit of a sharp edge to it. Later, as Kai and Katsu walk home together, he promises her that he's going to study hard so they can both make it into Oka Academy. She wishes him luck, but then out of the blue, asks which of the three girls was his type. Kai caught off guard and says he never really thought about it, though inside he's thinking that she is the one he likes, he just can't bring himself to say it. Then Katsu brings up how Kai was using everyone's first names today, but he doesn't get what she's hinting at. So this seems to annoy her, and before he knows it, she's storming off to her house. Later on, Kai is left scratching his head, trying to figure out why she got so mad. He thinks that maybe she was jealous of the other girls, but he brushes it off thinking that can't be it. Then he remembers a new problem. How is he going to explain his mysterious absence to Sylphie and Luceria tomorrow? We then see Kai is busy battling a slime in the dungeon, using insecticides to take it down. After the fight, he collects several slime cores, satisfied that he's gathered enough to feed his two servants for a while. Luceria is curious about Kai's activities and asks him what he was up to with Eri and the others the previous day. Kai casually explains that he was just on a school tour and playfully wonders if she even knows what a school is. Luceria snaps back, telling him not to mock her, but it's clear she's clueless. Sophie steps in to explain that a school is a place where humans go to study. Luceria grasps the concept and understands that Kai must have his reasons, but she's not happy about being ignored. Realizing he might have upset them, Kai quickly apologizes and offers them three magic cores as a peace offering. But these two aren't so easily appeased. They demand 100. In the middle of their negotiation, Kai spots a rare slime creeping up behind them. He tries to warn them, but they think he's just messing with them and don't even bother to look. Kai insists, but Luceria, irritated, casually destroys the slime without even turning around. With that handle, they turn back to Kai, pressing him on how he plans to make up for abandoning them. Knowing when he's beaten, Kai ups his offer to 10 cores, which finally satisfies them, but they make it clear, though, that he better not ignore them again. As he's gathering the slime's remains, Kai mimuses it dropped something special, gloves of force, and he discovers these gloves can exert an invisible force at the cost of the wearer's MP. So he heads to the 8th floor of the dungeon eager to test them, but at first he doesn't notice anything and assumes it's because the force is well invisible. But when he uses the gloves on water and sees the ripples, he realizes they work, though the force isn't as powerful as he hoped. Luceria dismisses the gloves of force as a worthless item, but Kai Ever the Experimenter tries combining the gloves' power with Balzard, and to his surprise, the magic sword manages to split the water, and he realizes he can manipulate small objects with precision. Just as he's getting the hang of it, Eri and the others join him, all geared up for another day of dungeon crawling. Kai takes a moment to thank Eri for the school tour, mentioning how much fun he had and expressing his determination to pass the exams, even though he knows he has a lot of work ahead of him. Eri, always supportive, offers to hold a study group to help him out, and Kai gratefully accepts and asks if he can invite Katsu as well. The girls exchange surprise glances, but Eri agrees and the rest of the group chimes in, saying they'll join too. Meanwhile, Kai's servants Luceria and Sylphie notice how much closer Kai is getting with the girls and can't help but pout a little. Kai, ever oblivious, asks them what's wrong. They claim it's nothing, but their sulking is pretty obvious. In an attempt to cheer them up, Kai offers them some magic cores, which they munch on while still pouting. The girls watching can't help but think the two servants are absolutely adorable. The group then prepares to descend to the ninth floor, a level none of them have ventured to before. 
Aerie warns everyone to stay sharp as they're heading into uncharted territory. As soon as they step onto the floor, Sylphie senses a powerful enemy lurking nearby. Kai, feeling a mix of excitement and anxiety, asks the group what they should do. The girls, determined as ever, insist on pressing forward. Kai quickly realizes there's no turning back as the path offers no alternate routes. Usiri, trying to sound confident, declares that she'll handle things if they get too dicey. Then Eri reassures everyone that there's no shame in retreating if the situation gets out of hand, but for now, they're all in it together. As they proceed cautiously, Sylphie suddenly alerts the group to the presence of a powerful monster, an Orthros. Lucyria is taken aback, not expecting to see such a formidable beast on the ninth floor. Kai agrees, realizing that a creature of this caliber shouldn't be lurking at this level, and suggests they turn back. But just as they decide to retreat, the Orthros lock onto their presence and launch an attack. Sylphie quickly erects her Iron Maiden wall to shield everyone, while Hikari traps the beast with her Earthwave spell. Lucyria follows up with her Hellfire of Destruction, but to her shock, it barely phases the monster. The Orthros retaliates with a fierce fire breath, and though the barrier absorbs the brunt of the attack, the group can still feel the intense heat. Lucyria then strikes back with a breath of erosion, but the Orthros remains unscathed. Mako orders Snatch to join the fray, but even his attacks barely scratch the beast. Kai then realizing they need a new strategy, tells Lucyria to keep hammering the Orthros with her attacks while he distracts it. So Lucyria unleashes another Hellfire of Destruction aimed at the monster's belly as Kai keeps it occupied, but Yuna's powerful assault fails to bring the Orthros down. Desperate Kai instructs Sylphie to combine her Divine Spear with Lucyria's Hellfire of Destruction in a synchronized attack. The two unleash their combined might on the Orthros, but the relentless creature still refuses to die. It turns its fury on Kai, who narrowly dodges, while Eri and Miko open fire to support him. The monster tries to attack them with its fire breath, but Kai uses Bowser, enhanced by the Gloves of Force, to land a critical blow on the Orthros. He follows up by blocking its mouth with a water ball, preventing it from unleashing its deadly fire breath. With the Orthros momentarily incapacitated, the group seizes the opportunity to launch a coordinated assault. After a relentless barrage of attacks, the mighty Orthros finally falls. Exhausted but victorious, the group celebrates their hard-won victory over the powerful beast. Kai, then eager to keep the momentum going, suggests they press forward, but the girls drain from the intense battle, insist they rest and recover before continuing. As the group takes a much-needed break, Kai hands out some magic cores to his servants as a reward for their hard work, praising them for their efforts. Despite the brief respite, Lucyria remains puzzled about why an Orthros was lurking on this floor, while Sylphie senses an even more powerful presence nearby. Their suspicions are confirmed when a demon appears, unfazed by the defeat of his dog. Kai and the others quickly realize that this demon was the one controlling the Orthros, and Lucyrian notes the demon's formidable strength. The demon with a chilling calm declares that none of them will leave the dungeon alive, so without any damn warning, he unleashes a dark spell called Darkmare. Sylphie responds instantly, erecting a barrier to shield the group. The demon, swift as a shadow, dashes forward with a sword slash, but Sylphie's barrier holds firm. Kai, struggling to keep up with the demon's lightning-fast movements, senses the gravity of their situation. So he quickly gives Sylphie more magic cores, urging her to maintain the barrier at all costs. But despite their combined efforts to attack from within the safety of the barrier, their strikes barely make a dent in the demon's defenses. So Lucyria suggests that they might need Sylphie to go on the offensive, but Kai hesitates, worried about the safety of his teammates. Reassuring him, Eri confidently declares that she can handle the demon's sword, no matter how fast it is. Trusting in his friends, Kai gives the go-ahead, and Sylphie lowers the barrier. Then Sylphie and Luceria launch a coordinated assault on the demon, but their attacks still fail to break through his defenses. The demon now focusing on Kai attempts a lethal strike, but Ares steps in to protect him. The demon with brutal strength flings her into the wall and turns his attention back to Kai. Kai manages to block the demon's attack with Bowser, but the force shatters the demon's sword. Infuriated by the loss of his weapon at Yif from the Duke, the demon retaliates with a powerful punch, sending Kai flying. Sylphie and Luceria, enraged by the attack on their master, unleash a furious assault on the demon, joined by Snatch. Then we see Kai quickly heal himself with a potion, and Miko rushes to his side, concerned for his well-being. Kai assures her that he's fine, but he asks her for a favor. Understanding his plan, Miko and Snatch join forces and attack the demon together, creating an opening for Kai. Seizing the opportunity, Kai stabs the demon from behind with Balzard, channeling its power to tear a gaping hole in the demon's body. The demon crumples to his knees and for a moment, Kai hopes that the battle is over. But to his dismay, the demon uses magic to heal the wound almost instantly. 
With a roar of anger, the demon punches Kai with such force that he sends him flying again. The girls rush to protect Kai, but the demon barrels through them effortlessly. Sophie makes a valiant attempt to stop him, only to be thrown against the wall. Luceria, then determined to protect Kai, urges him to run while she holds the demon off. But instead of fleeing, Kai racks his brain for a way to defeat this seemingly invincible foe. But his efforts seem futile, as he realizes he has nothing left in his arsenal, and the demon overpowers Luceria, shoving her aside with ease. Kai realizes that running away alone isn't an option and wonders how he can kill this demon, but suddenly he remembers Luceria's skill, the beauty of gluttony. This ability would allow her to temporarily power up by consuming her contractor's HP, so Kai quickly asks Luceria to activate the skill, despite knowing the cost it would take on him. Luceria hesitates, reminding him that it would mean consuming his life force, but Kai insists, seeing no other way out of their dire situation. Reluctantly, Luceria agrees, revealing her true form by devouring Kai's HP. As she transforms, Kai is shocked to see her mature into a more powerful version of herself. Luceria explains that the beauty of gluttony has restored her to her former level, though this is still not her complete form. But she assures Kai that this power is more than enough to defeat the demon. The demon initially unrecognizes her, and she tells him that she is going to kill him. The stupid demon doesn't realize how powerful she is now, and he carelessly attacks her, but his blows bounce off her harmlessly. He starts freaking out and attacks her again, but it ends with the same futile result, so he demands to know who the hell she is. Luceria introduces herself as a Viscount-class devil, sending shivers down the demon's spine. Realizing the grave mistake he made in underestimating her, the demon tries to shift his attitude, but Luceria is far beyond forgiving. Enraged by the harm done to her friends, she prepares to unleash the storm of divine destruction. The demon in utter disbelief realizes that such a powerful attack shouldn't even be possible for a Viscount-class demon. He wonders about her true origins, but it's too late. With a devastating force, Luceria annihilates him with her attack. After the battle, Kai, exhausted and drained, asks Luceria to cancel her beauty of gluttony ability, as he's already at his limit. But Luceria, reveling in her newly regained grown-up form, stubbornly refuses. Kai, desperate, pleads with her, but she playfully insists on knowing what he thinks of her adult appearance first. Frustrated, he points out that this isn't the time for such things, but she stands firm, refusing to cancel the ability until he gives her an answer. Reluctantly, Kai compliments her adult form, admitting she looks stunning. Satisfied with his response, Luceria then cheekily asks if he'll treat her as kindly as he does Sylphie. Seeing no other way out, Kai agrees and only then does she cancel her ability, reverting to her childlike form. Kai narrowly avoids a fatal fate, and the group quickly takes the time to heal up by downing potions, restoring their strength. As they recuperate, Kai notices that he has leveled up to level 18, with an HP boost of 8 points. He also discovers a new skill called Slight Pain Resistance, which seems fitting given the ordeal they've just survived. The girls have also leveled up, which Kai figures was inevitable after the intense battle, and the girls seem happy that they managed to survive against all odds. Before heading back home, Kai checks the loot from the battle. He finds Orthro's magic core, the biggest core he's seen so far. Meanwhile, Miko and Hikari are searching the dungeon for something, but it seems this core isn't what they were looking for. Kai then spots something else dropped by the demon. A servant card. He's unsure what to do with it, and Eri and the others leave the decision up to him since he and Luceria were the ones who defeated the demon. Luceria and Sylphie suggest simply selling the card, but Kai hesitates, thinking that the demon might be useful, especially since he was stronger than both of his current servants. Curiosity piqued, he decides to summon the knight-class demon named Belly. However, upon summoning him, Kai is dismayed to find that Belly has taken the form of a child, much like his other servants. Kai frustrated asks Belly why he's so small, and the demon explains that his level has been reset. Regretting his decision to summon him, Kai mutters that he might as well sell him instead, leaving Belly shocked and visibly concerned. Sometime later, we see Kai relaxing in the bathhouse within the dungeon, trying to unwind after the intense day. Belly, eager to please, is scrubbing Kai's back with an enthusiasm that makes Kai a bit uncomfortable and thinks it won't be cool if someone sees them like this. But Belly is desperate not to be abandoned and asks Kai if they'll stay together. To get him to stop, Kai reassures him with a promise that they'll stay together forever. Overwhelmed with gratitude, Belly hugs Kai, but Kai feels awkward about the whole situation. Meanwhile, in the neighboring girl's bath, his other servants overhear the exchange and assume that Kai and Belly are getting along well. Later, Kai takes the crystal of Orthros to an appraiser to sell it. The appraiser is intrigued and asks where he found such a valuable item, so Kai nonchalantly explains that they acquired it after defeating an Orthros on the ninth floor of the dungeon. The appraiser is shocked and immediately plans to send a team to investigate the area. 
She then informs Kai that the crystal is worth a staggering 24 million yen, and Kai is shocked at the amount. She then offers to transfer the money directly to his account, but Kai insists on splitting the money equally among the four of them, as they all played a part in the battle. The others insist that he keep it all, but Kai is not comfortable with that and insists on sharing, so they eventually agree to take their share. The appraiser then mentions that she can provide him with the necessary paperwork for income tax, leaving Kai utterly confused as he's never dealt with taxes before. The next scene finds Kai at a cafe with the girls, feeling a bit sheepish for dragging them through a lecture on income tax after such a tiring day. The girls assure him that it's no big deal, and Kai, clearly out of his depth, asks them what he's supposed to do now. They give him some practical advice, suggesting he save all his expenditure receipts to reduce his tax liability as much as possible. Kai, realizing he usually tosses receipts, decides to start keeping them from now on. As the day winds down, Hikari leaves in her car and Eri remarks that it's been a hectic day. She mentions that Kai must have some kind of magnetism for attracting special things, but he dismisses the idea, even though he momentarily wonders if she might be onto something, considering his three servant cards. But he quickly shakes off the thought, convincing himself that it's just a coincidence. The scene shifts to Miko chatting with Hikari over the phone. Hikari is all pumped up for the weekend's raid, eager to see everyone's new skills in action. But Miko advises her not to push herself too hard and suggests she take a break if she needs it. Hikari brushes it off, insisting she's fine and doesn't want to waste time resting. Mako relents, saying she'll see her on the weekend, then ends the call. As soon as the call ends, Hikari drops her tough girl act and starts coughing, revealing she's not as okay as she pretends to be. Next, we jump to the weekend where Kai and the crew are deep in the dungeon. Kai asks Belly to show off his power, but Belly hesitantly asks if he can get a proper weapon first, which surprises Kai since Belly doesn't have one. Wuseria chimes in, reminding Kai that he was the one who broke Belly's last weapon. So Kai digs through his bag and pulls out a tungsten rod he bought earlier, handing it to Belly. Belly hesitates again, asking for something more like a sword. Sylphie and Luceria take offense, thinking Belly is being rude by not accepting what their master offered, prompting him to quickly apologize. Kai explains it's all he has at the moment, so Belly reluctantly accepts. We then see Belly in action, fighting monsters with a tungsten rod and taking them down with ease. Kai impressed realizes Belly might actually be stronger than him, and Belly hopes that proves his worth to Kai. Luceria, however, points out that Belly is moving slower than usual, and he admits he's still adjusting to his current level. Then with teary eyes, he pleads to stay by Kai's side, expressing his desire to serve Princess Luceria and Princess Sylphie. As usual, his flattery hits the mark with the girls. Then Belly admits he might be a liability for now, but promises he'll eventually become Kai's sword and give it his all. Kai agrees to keep him around, mentioning that he may be slower, but he's strong enough. Kai looks forward to working together, and Belly gratefully thanks him. Kai then decides it's time to put some skills to the test, starting with Belly. He engages in a few monster fights, purposefully letting his HP drop to dangerous levels to see how Belly's dark cure skill works in action. When he's on the brink of collapse, he calls on Belly to cast the spell. The moment Belly does, Kai feels a wave of recovery wash over him, but he's quick to notice that his HP only recovers slightly. Belly explains that Dark Cure is designed primarily to heal injuries, restoring HP just enough to keep someone from dying. Kai is disappointed because he had hoped to use Dark Cure in tandem with Luceria's Beauty of Gluttony ability to extend its effects. Luceria hears this and suggests they try it anyway, but Kai refuses, pointing out that he doesn't have much HP left to play with. Luceria, not one to be deterred, insists he won't die instantly and even contemplates transforming into her adult form again. Kai, sensing danger, tries to escape but ends up tripping in his haste. Belly steps in to heal Kai's injury with another Dark Cure spell. This time, Kai notices that his wound no longer hurts, which leads him to appreciate Belly's skill, realizing it's going to save him a lot of potions in the long run. Belly beams with pride at the compliment, and the group moves on to the deeper floors of the dungeon. Soon, they encounter a metal golem, and Eri and the others step up to show off their prowess. Hikari uses her Ice Circle skill to freeze the golem in its tracks, while Eri finishes it off with a powerful iron slash, slicing it clean in half. Kai is impressed by their teamwork, but Eri warns that her skill consumes a lot of MP, so she can't afford to miss her target. Next, they face off against three Earth Golems, giving Miko and Snatch a chance to shine. Miko casts Dance of Illusions tricking the Golems, while Snatch charges in with his Hedgehog skill, taking them down with precision. Kai notes how much stronger their combination has become and decides it's time to test Sylphie's new ability. As they venture further into the dungeon, more monsters appear. Kai instructs Sylphie to activate her Song of the War Maiden's skill, and tells Luceria and Belly to join the fray as well because he wants to see if Sylphie's skill can boost his servant's power too or not. 
Sylphie then begins her song, and as her voice fills the air, an ethereal angel appears, blessing Kai and his servants with powerful buffs. They feel an immediate surge of strength, and they can also predict the monster's movements with ease. The next wave of enemies doesn't stand a chance. They're all taken down with a single strike from each of them. After the fight, Wisiria excitedly tells Kai that she felt a noticeable boost in her power. While it wasn't as overwhelming as the effect from the beauty of gluttony, it definitely made her stronger, and Kai is relieved to know that Sylphie's skill benefits his servants too. He turns to Belly to get his feedback, but Belly sheepishly admits that he didn't feel any difference. Ares suggests that maybe the skill's effect varies depending on the level of trust, which makes Belly a bit disheartened. But Ari tells him to keep his chin up, there's always time to build trust. The rest of the group joins in, cheering him on, and Belly feels a swell of determination. He proudly mentions that though he started as a rearguard, he's now risen to knighthood, and with better swordsmanship, he can be even more formidable. He hints that having a proper sword might help with that, so Kai tells him to hold on a moment. Kai leaves briefly and returns with a sword. He hands it to Belly, asking if he can do better with this weapon. Belly realizes it's a bastard sword, and though he initially says nothing, the others wonder if he doesn't like it. But then to everyone's surprise, Belly's eyes well up with tears. He's overwhelmed with joy to finally have a real sword. He vows to do his absolute best and immediately tests up the sword against some monsters. With ease, he slices through them like butter, leaving everyone amazed by his skill. Afterward, Belly hands over the magic crystals they collected to Kai, mentioning that he feels even more motivated now that he has a real sword. Kai thanks him for his hard work, which boosts Belly's spirits further. Kai then wonders aloud if Belly could teach him some swordsmanship, and Belly eagerly agrees and suggests they start right away, but Kai reluctantly admits he has to leave early today. Sylphie and Luceria are curious and ask why. Kai tries to brush it off, but Eri reveals the truth. It's because they're having a study group at her house tomorrow. The servant girls pout at the news, clearly disappointed, but Kai apologizes and promises the girls and Belly to return soon. The scene then shifts to Kai, his friends and Katsu arriving at Eri's house, and they're all stunned by how massive it is. Meiko and Hikari show up in their cars, and as they head inside, they find themselves surrounded by what seems like an endless forest, wondering where the actual house is. They spot the girls comfortably sitting in a car heading towards the house, so Kai asks if they can hitch a ride. But the girls casually point out the path meant for the men, and the guys are left in disbelief that they'll have to walk. Later, the girls greet Eri at her house, and Katsu can't help but comment on how elegant her home is. Eri graciously accepts the compliment and explains that her house has been a dojo for generations, designed to balance the mind, body, and technique. She points out the dojo for skill training, a waterfall for calming the mind, and a garden meant for physical conditioning. She adds that the hill is perfect for building basic strength, and she uses it daily. When the guys finally make it to the house, they're completely exhausted, but Eri is unfazed and suggests they jump right into their study session. The guys barely catching their breath are shocked because they were hoping for at least a moment to rest. Eri leads them to the dojo and they're puzzled about why they're there. They expected to be taken to her room, but she explains that her room isn't big enough for everyone. Plus, she likes to practice her spear swings here in case she needs to refocus, and if they can't concentrate, there's always the waterfall. The guys exchange glances, pretty sure Eri is the only one who would actually do such things, and with that, they all settle down to study. Everyone settles into their desired spots, with Kai aiming to sit next to Katsu, but that seat's already snagged. Eri, ever the opportunist, invites him to sit next to her instead. Katsu can't help but feel a pang of jealousy seeing them side by side, and Eri wastes no time asking Kai what he wants to tackle first. Kai chooses math problems, and Eri dives right in to help. Meanwhile, Katsu's jealousy meter keeps rising, especially as she watches them get a little too cozy for her liking. Hikari then asks Katsu to teach her instead, and Katsu agrees, but then Shinji tries to jump in, offering to help too. Hayato quickly shuts him down, telling him he's just being a nuisance, and claims that Hikari can ask him for help since he's apparently a genius at everything. Kai, noticing the tension, jokes that Shinji and Hayato are practically the same, which makes Hikari insist on learning from Katsu. Kai thinks that Katsu will do a great job teaching Hikari since she's always been caring and kind, so his friends chime in from the background, teasing him by saying he knows Katsu quite well, and that she's also cute. This makes the other girls a bit jealous, so Kai quickly clarifies that he and Katsu are just childhood friends. After a while, the girls start struggling to focus on their studies, and Eri suggests they take a break by going to the waterfalls. The boys are hesitant, considering it's winter, but when the girls agree, Kai's friends jump on board too, leaving Kai, with no choice but to tag along. The scene shifts to the waterfalls, where the boys immediately notice how freezing the water is, but the girls don't seem to mind. They head into the waterfall first, letting the cold water clear their minds for a while before stepping out. 
Eri asks them how it was, and they respond that their minds feel a bit clearer now. Kai checks in on Katsu, and she assures him she's fine, but he can't help but notice how cute she looks with her clothes soaked. Then it's the boys' turn, and they bravely step into the freezing water, but it doesn't take long before they tap out. As everyone heads out that night, Shinji and Hayato joke about how the freezing waterfall wiped their brains clean of anything they studied. The girls, on the other hand, had a blast and are already planning the next round. The guys notice how much better everyone is getting along than in the morning and Kai can't help but feel a bit relieved to see it. The next day, Luceria and Sylphie catch wind that Kai was busy splashing around in the waterfall instead of hitting the books. The girls confirm it with grins, saying the fun actually left them in top shape today. Hikari chimes in, confident that at this rate they'll reach the 10th floor in no time, but the servants are not thrilled about missing out on the fun, so Luceria is determined to be more useful than Eri and the others as they press onward. As they continue, Miko pulls Hikari aside, gently reminding her not to overdo it. Hikari though brushes it off, saying she's been having the time of her life lately. She wishes these days could last forever and quietly admits she dreams of becoming a hero. Just then, Stilfi senses monsters up ahead. Two silver orcs and a lizard man. Kai quickly orders Sylphie to sing the War Maiden's song, boosting everyone's stats. Hikari then freezes the monsters with her ice circle, while Belly charges at the lizard man and Eri and Kai swiftly take down the silver orcs. More monsters appear, but Miko and Snatch handle them with a perfectly coordinated attack. Eri joins the fray and with Kai and Belly, they make quick work of the remaining threats. After the fight is over, Kai is taken aback by how easily they're cutting through the monsters on the ninth floor, but Luceria is frustrated she didn't get to contribute. She blurts out that she wants to be useful too, and Kai reassures her, calming her down. He then hands out magic crystals to all his servants and Hikari with a hopeful smile, wishes that they can keep enjoying moments like this. The group then approaches the stairs leading to the 10th floor, and Kai hesitates wondering if they should proceed. Hikari confidently insists they should and leads the way, but suddenly she begins to feel unwell and collapses. The others are alarmed as they see blood coming from her mouth and Miko, with tears in her eyes, desperately pleads for Hikari to wake up. That's it for this video, guys. If you like this new series, leave a like for the next episode. And subscribe for more Anon content. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.